dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga polisi at programa ng desyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag po'y siya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget under the Databases tab or type serp-p.pids.gov.pa. SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Social Economic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. 
This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahin problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making itong bigyan din ng kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! In need of references for your research, do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget under the databases tab or type serp pidsgovpa SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERP has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERP provides comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERP, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs. 
research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series, where we feature our policy studies and the insights of government policymakers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars, and civil society actors. With this webinar series, which we started in 2020, PIDS hopes to provide an accessible venue for evidence-based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I'm Sheila Siar, your moderator. Two weeks ago, we had an engaging discussion about the state of food security in the Philippines. This afternoon, we'll talk about another basic need, which is shelter or housing. We'll look into the affordability of housing in the Philippines, see what the different entities in the public and private sectors are doing to address the housing gap, and discuss ways to make safe, decent, and affordable housing accessible to all Filipinos. To start our conversation and give us more information about today's topic, may I call on our president at PIDS, Dr. Aniceto Arbeta, Jr. Sir? Thank you, Sheila. 
Uh, before we begin, uh, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the following officials. Uh, from the government, we have uh, Senate of the Philippines Economic Planning Policy Studies Service Director, Cersis Nitafan, House of Representatives Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, Socioeconomic Research Bureau Executive Director, Manuel Aquino, Banco Central ng Filipinas Director, Veron Veronica Banyagos, uh, Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development Director, Jovi Francis Tupas, Pasig uh, Philippine Counts Counselors League President, Kin Cruz, uh, architects, uh, urban and environmental planners, engineers from various agencies. Uh, the private sector, from the private sector, we have uh, Peer Counseling Foundations of the Philippines President, Maria Rebecca Rugacion, uh, Maximilian at Advisors Chief Operating Officer Maria Teresa Magisa. From the CSOs and NGOs, we have Homeless People's uh, Federation Philippines Incorporated President Teresa Karampat Tana and Development Action for Women Network President Milagros Makiling, Technical Assistance Movement for People and Environment Incorporated Executive Director Louis Robert Posadas. We also like to greet our friends from the media and let me also greet our uh, guests, uh, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, and those watching through the PIDS and SERPI uh, Facebook pages. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. Today we will talk about housing in the Philippines and how affordable it is for Filipinos. This topic is especially relevant given the rising demand for housing, which is a human right. The Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development, or DSSUD, uh, estimated an accumulated housing need of 6.5 million from 2017 to 2022. The housing surge in the country continues to grow uh, due to factors such as rising prices and population growth. Urbanization also plays a big role in this shortage. A World Bank policy paper noted that the Philippines is one of the fastest urbanizing countries in Southeast Asia. Since 1950s, millions have migrated from rural to urban areas in search for, for better opportunities. The unprecedented rate of in-migration resulted in not just a surge in demand for jobs, but also in demand for housing, particularly in urban areas. Climate change and conflict likewise contribute to the demand for housing. Families flee uh, from coastal communities to densely populated cities with such hazards threaten their health, livelihood, and lives. What must we do when the sector is uh, in need of the housing consists of low-income families and housing prices remain too expensive? How can the Philippine government and private sector keep up with the housing backlog and provide housing that is not only affordable but also satisfies the basic shelter attributes set uh, by the U U UN uh, Habitat? This afternoon, we will feature the study titled Measuring uh, Housing Affordability in the Philippines, authored by PIDS Vice President Marifi Ballesteros and Supervising Research Specialist Tatum Ramos, Ramos and, and Research Specialist Janica Anciata. Dr. Ballesteros and Mr. Ram, Ms. Ramos will uh, present their analysis of housing affordability in the Philippines, including the challenges and trends in housing prices and household incomes. They will also provide recommendations to make housing more affordable to all the Filipinos. To enrich the conversation, we invited uh, resource persons from agencies involved in the different aspects of the country's housing provision. OIC Director Ruena Dineros of the DHSUD will discuss the department's current initiatives and plans to address the housing backlog. In addition, Executive Director Santiago Ducay of the subdivision and uh, Housing Developers Association Incorporated will talk about the role of the private sector in housing provision, financing services, and projections for post uh, for the post-pandemic uh, housing market. Finally, we have Dr. Winston Conrad Padohinog, the president of the University of Asia and the Pacific. He will share his insights on the business models for housing construction projects to solve the housing backlog and the ways to make housing more affordable, especially for low-income households. It is an honor for PIDS to have all of you at this event and hear your insights on the topic. 
to our attendees. I encourage you to participate actively in the open forum. Thank you for your continued patronage of our webinar series. I now give back the floor to the medical moderator, Sheila. Thank you very much, Dr. Orbeta. In addition to the officials mentioned by uh, our president, we also, we also would like to acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, SHDA Chairman, Mr. George C. Okay. So before I introduce our presenters, allow me to remind you of our guidelines to join the discussion. So you may post your questions and comments using the Q&A button. So please indicate your name and organization if you want to be identified when I read out the questions. You may use Tagalog if you are more comfortable expressing yourself in Tagalog. And to all the presenters and discussants, you may respond by typing your answers, which will be visible to all attendees. Alternatively, you can choose to answer the questions live during the open forum. And for our live stream, live stream viewers on Facebook, we highly encourage you to participate as well. Please use the comment section on Facebook for your questions. And we will accommodate as many questions as possible that are relevant to the discussion during the open forum. So now that we have set the house rules, let us begin our conversation by listening to the presentation, which is based on a PIDS uh, discussion paper titled um, as mentioned by Dr. Orbeta, Measuring Housing Affordability in the Philippines, which was authored by PIDS Vice President Marife Ballesteros, Supervising Research Specialist Tatum Ramos, and Research Specialist Jenica Ancheta. The presentation will be made by Dr. Ballesteros and Ms. Ramos. Dr. Balgisteros' research area is development economics with specialization in housing policy, land, land policy, and urban development. She has been involved in several evaluation studies of government regulatory policies and property programs. And she has been a consultant on several projects of the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, USAID, and AUSAID. She has a PhD in social sciences um, from the Catholic University, uh, Rad. Radbal um, University in the Netherlands and an MA degree in economics from the School of Economics, University of the Philippines. On the other hand, Ms. Ramos's uh, research area is urban development and she earned her master's degree in public policy with specialization in management and leadership from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, and her bachelor's degree in economics from the UP School of Economics. She has authored publications. She has co-authored publications in housing. So Dr. Balisteros and Ms. Ramos, you now have the virtual floor. Thank you, Sheila, for that uh, kind introduction. And good afternoon to our participants and attendees of this webinar. As a uh, flash on the screen, uh, that is the title of the study that we are, will be presenting, Measuring Housing Affordability in the Philippines. And uh, an assessment of housing affordability um, is actually important as a starting point to understand the housing market as well as to craft in crafting policies to make housing affordable, inclusive, and resilient in the country. And there are several measures as uh, shown on the screen of housing affordability. On the, the left side of the screen are the scarcely used approaches and emerging novel approaches. This is ra rarely used because you, it requires a more detailed uh, information and special surveys, which most countries do not have detailed on the housing uh, unit, but as well as not only on, as well as details about the house, the household. On the right hand side of the screen is the more is the conventional approaches, which are actually used uh, in uh, most inter, uh, countries. And this is composed of three components, the residual income method, the price income ratio, and the composite method, which is just a combination of uh, uh, the residual and uh, the peer. If you look at these measures, this uh, the conventional measures are mainly um, uh, primarily relate income to the housing price. Although this can be a limitation, we also know that uh, a key factor, an important factor 
um, that determines access to housing is actually uh, affordability. So there's a very high correlation between income and access to housing. And our research will be focusing mainly on uh, several uh, on affordability measures using the conventional approaches. Next slide, please. So the objectives of the study is first, we are to determine uh, whether the 30% of income standard captures housing affordability in the Philippines. And we all know that uh, for the, uh, what we are using now in the Philippines is actually the, the, the rule of thumb or a standard called the 30% of income standard, which is actually used in several countries. But is it actually uh, suitable in the case of the Philippines or more importantly, does it capture housing affordability in the Philippines? The second is after we evaluate housing affordability, the country using other methods and suggest possible improvements in the measuring, in, in the measurement. And uh, lastly, we, we will be recommending knowing uh, the, the, the structure of our housing demand. We, we will recommend housing policy reforms that could make uh, housing affordable, inclusive and resilient, especially in urban countries. So uh, we argue, next slide, please that the 30% uh, income standard that is currently being used as a measure of housing uh, affordability is not a suitable measure for in, in the Philippines because uh, this is mainly based actually on developed countries' experience. Actually, the 30%, as I mentioned, is a rule of thumb. And even during the post-war, the assumption is that if you can spend or pay housing, whether rent or amortization, that is equivalent to one week's wages, then uh, we, we say that housing is affordable. And later on, this was increased to 30% based on the experience of developed countries. There's a time series that looks into the, the income price ratio of 387, 67 metropolitan cities in nine developed countries. And apparently this is what, what are the standards that is, uh, uh, arising from that uh, uh, from that data, so above thirty percent, that would be slightly um, unaffordable, and then you have moderately unaffordable housing if it's above fifty percent. The other reason is that uh, why we we set this uh, argument is that um, in uh, developed countries there is the low incidence of poverty and a significant proportion of middle income. Uh, uh, families, which is not the case in the Philippines, where you have uh, about 47% low-income families and you have uh, about 20% uh, that's uh, vulnerable, um, uh, low, also low-income, uh, vulnerable families, although they, they, we consider them as middle-income families. And this, the third reason is that uh, if you look at the, the real wages, over time in the Philippines, this is actually not, not rising. And whatever increases in wages that we experience is just enough to cover for inflationary uh, effects. So um, next slide, please. So I think uh, this is just showing you the, the proportion that I mentioned a while ago in terms of uh, the segmentation of, uh, of households based on income. And uh, the classification of poor, low income, low middle income, uh, et cetera, is based on the study done by uh, uh, Dr. Alberts, also of PIDS, where she, he was able to classify um, the households into, into these categories instead of the, the decile. But it's actually related to, to the decile. So poor are those, of course, below the poverty threshold. The low income but not poor is twice, have incomes twice the, the poverty threshold, uh, lower middle income four times the, the poverty threshold and, and so on. So, so there is a, a, a factor that increases the, the income of household based on the poverty threshold. So uh, given that, I would like to turn over the, the, the mic to my co-author uh, Tatum Ramos to pr present the results of the study. Tatum? Thank you, Ma'am Teng. Okay, so um, given the profiles that were presented by Dr. Balesteros, um, we were interested in knowing the percentages of income that's allotted to housing expenditure. 
if you look at the third column of this table, you will notice that uh, the, the percentages are around 10%. And that would give an impression that housing in the Philippines was affordable back in 2018. However, we, we knew that we had to make additional verifications on this. So first, we, 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 we tried getting the 30% standard housing expenditure. And from that, and also income, we were able to generate the annual receivable income based on the 30% standard. So this is also the, the income that is left to be allotted or can be allotted still to non-housing basic expenditure. We then compared the values with those of the threshold or the minimum non-housing basic expenditure, which includes food and non-food um, items. All right, so um, in the last column of this table, you will notice that the poor and the low income, but not poor, uh, seem to be vulnerable to housing stress. This is because their annual receivable incomes uh, fall below or a little just above the, the threshold or the minimum non-housing basic expenditure. We also adopted this measure called um, Housing Affordability Index, or the HAI, which is usually defined as the ratio of median family income to the qualifying income that's required to make payment for a median-priced house. And a value of 100 for the HAI, or the Housing Affordability Index, means that the median income family has sufficient income to purchase a median-priced house. And we, we tried getting the estimates for um, selected areas based on available data. So you will notice that on the table, the values of the HAR, HAI are below 100. And this um, would reflect that a typical family in the, in, in, in the particular areas were not able to afford housing that's being supplied in the market back in 2018. Now, if we look at the trend of HAI in the Philippines based on government price ceilings, you will notice that um, a typical family in the Philippines would not be, would rather, they would be able to afford socialized housing, but would not be able to afford economic housing. And this is important particularly because we would expect um, typical families to be able to afford these economic housing that's priced at the, at the ceilings because these housings are particularly, or should be particularly, particularly catering to these families. We were also able to compile information from the NHA, Shafsi, and DSUD, and um, we, we came up with this map that um, shows the distances of low-cost housing projects to the nearest urban centers in Metro Manila. And we find that um, many of the projects were actually quite far from the, from the city centers or the nearest urban centers in Metro Manila. And this ha would have, of course, implications on transportation costs and because especially if, if families or family members are working within um, the, the urban centers or, or within the city centers. Also, um, transportation costs um, would need to be considered when we're talking about housing affordability. Now, if we look at um, this particular data that's um, based from, uh, that, that was taken from the Global Property Guide, and the data was also featured by Behind Asia in 2022. And this shows us the house price to income ratio in the Philippines versus neighboring countries, some of the neighboring countries in Asia. And if you look at the figure, you will notice that the Philippines is actually one of the top countries that are, that have, were in housing was an affordable or is an affordable. And given all those um, initial insights, our team wanted specifically to determine the affordable housing packages in the Philippines. And we used um, the residual income method um, to be able to generate this. 
uh, we use this method because this measure this measures housing affordability based on factors including non-housing expenditure and sufficiency of income after housing expenditure. Under this method, housing is considered affordable if household income minus housing expenditure is greater than or equal a minimum non-housing expenditure. The method also provides insights on extent of housing stress or shelter poverty. Housing stress is experienced if household income minus housing expenditure minus minimum non-housing expenditure is less than zero. In other words, the stress is experienced if the income of um, the household is not sufficient to cover for basic expenditures. So what are the components of that minimum non-housing basic expenditure? We've listed down these items on, uh, on the table on the left-hand side of the screen. And these items were based on PSA's total basic expenditure items. So just to run through this, we have food expenditure based on food threshold and family size, expenditures on clothing, footwear, and other wear, water supply and miscellaneous services relating to the dwelling, electricity, gas, and other fuels, medical care, education, transportation, communication, non-durable furnishings, and personal care and effects. We were also, um, we were able to generate the thresholds for non-housing basic expenditures. And again, these food thresholds were, the food thresholds used were based on PSA, PSA estimates. Um, and we also considered family sizes. And for the non-food threshold that's based on the average expenditures, in the, in the first to fifth income deciles, which are assumed to be the poor and the low income, but not poor. All right, um, if, if you look at the table on the right, you will notice that the thresholds vary according to the areas. So for example, um, Metro Manila or the urban areas of Pambanga have the highest values. And also for, um, uh, in terms of family, Types, these thresholds also vary. So those with um, family size of two have lower thresholds than those of family size of five with three children. When we adopt or, or, or take into consideration those thresholds, we are able to um, estimate or gauge the extent of shelter poverty based on socialized housing price ceiling. So this table um, on, on the Philippines and urban areas in the Philippines, they tell us that the poor have negative residual incomes after housing expenditure and thresholds for non-housing basic expenditure are subtracted from the income. So in other words, this just tells us that the poor were experiencing housing stress when it comes to socialized housing that were priced at the ceilings. And at the ceiling in 2018. And also the vulnerability um, covers even the low income but not poor when it comes to economic housing priced at the ceiling in 2018. Now, um, when we compare um, the residual income method and the 30% standard, we notice that for uh, the 30% standard underestimates the percentage of families under socialized housing stress in 2018. So just to illustrate further, um, in, in urban areas in the Philippines, the 30% standard tells us that 8% of, of the families back then were experiencing socialized housing stress. While um, for the residual income method, it tells us that 21% of the families were under housing stress. For economic housing, um, the 30% standard overestimates the percentage of families under housing stress. But it is still important to note that um, the values or the percentages are quite large. Um, for example, in the Philippines, 56, under their seedwall income method, 56% of 
the families were under economic housing stress in 2018. Now, we also considered um, the, the lifestyles of, of the families within the income groups. And in this table, you will see the affordability ratios based on the mean, not, mean annual non-housing expenditures in 2018. You will notice that the poor do not have any income that can do not have sufficient income that can be allotted to housing. But when you look at the low income but not poor, they are able, they were able to meet the 30% standard. However, as you go across the other income groups, you will notice also that the, val the, uh, the values of the affordability ratio vary. So um, this just implies that the 30% standard is not applicable in the Philippines. But what is, what is more important to look at actually is are the affordable housing packages. And it's also important to compare those with the price ceilings during that period. So in this table, we are showing you the affordable housing packages based on the mean annual non-housing basic expenditure in 2018. Uh, again, the poor do, uh, cannot afford any housing package, while the low income but not poor and the lower middle income were not would not be able to afford housing that was that were priced at the ceilings, um, economic housing priced at the ceilings, which I think around uh, in 2018 was around um, 1.7 million. Now, what can we derive from these um, findings? First is that the extent of housing stress um, tells us that housing is, has not been affordable in the Philippines. Um, and also the 30% the standard um, is not a suitable method to, to generate or to determine housing affordability in the country because it overestimates um, uh, housing affordability among the poor, while it underestimates the affordability among higher income groups. Also, the, the residual income method um, is able to give us a more accurate or can provide us, us a more accurate picture of housing affordability given affordable housing packages um, and also given comparisons with the price ceilings. So to further conclude, um, this presentation and to provide recommendations of the study, we I, I give the floor to Dr. Basteras. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Taitung. Please uh, go to the next slide. Yeah, so given what we know about uh, uh, affordability levels in the Philippines, as well as the apparent mismatch between uh, housing afford affordability, households affordability, and what is available, what is supplied in the formal market, we we uh, recommend a certain uh, what you call enabling uh, policies and rules that will uh, hope to improve uh, the functioning of the housing market. And uh, these reforms are actually pro providing and enabling governance as well as a legal framework that uh, would uh, set the tone for housing programs and housing interventions in, in the country. The first is uh, a government, we, we think, we, we suggest that in the case of the poor and, and for socialized housing or affordable housing development, the government plays a very important role. In fact, if you look at the, the history of other countries, when the country is still at, at the sta early stages of development, and I think in the case of the Philippines, although we are emerging, if we look at uh, developments of household, we are still at the, uh, at, uh, at the low level or the early stages, uh, there is, you move towards non-market solutions in addressing uh, of um, the housing uh, needs of the poor and the, the low income households. So uh, yeah, given that the government 
should uh, provide, uh, needs to create a public housing fund. It's really earmarked for housing. And this is not only at the national level, but also at the local level. And this can be used to uh, support um, uh, provision of, uh, of housing. Uh, this is this either to a slum upgrading or provision of public house rental housing. Um, it can also be used to, to, to fund uh, subsidies, direct subsidies. And as we have been repeatedly saying, uh, subsidies should be well targeted and it's not open, uh, that in which the access to housing will not really be the middle income, but really those who are in need. The other, uh, I think, important consideration for government's role in the housing market is to really create a land community trust. This is actually separating land, um, a self-containment of certain um, land, um, government lands that can be used uh, for, um, for the development of affordability, affordable housing, and can actually be passed on to, uh, to new sets or new households that would need it. Because we know that um, households, there will be improvement in income over time of households. And probably uh, if you are uh, low income at this, at, at this time, you will, in the future, you can afford housing in the market. And therefore you, you'll be able to, instead of you keeping the asset that has been uh, provided, but through government subsidy, then uh, we can, this can be uh, sold, this can be uh, uh, allocated to a more deserving or underserved household. So the way to do it is actually through a land community trust. You separate actually land from the building itself. In some countries, they can even buy, uh, own the building, but you can only sell it to the uh, to the uh, land, whoever is involved uh, uh, to, to government or whoever is managing the land trust, or it can be in the form of, of rental. So uh, I think that's very important in the case of uh, to have affordable housing and to retain that in even in urban areas. Uh, the other one is, which is also related to government uh, a role is the development of your rental rental housing. And I think this has been uh, already em uh, emphasized in several uh, studies and discussion. And it's a good thing that, uh, that uh, the House Committee at the Senate and Legislative uh, um, Senate and Congress have already come up with this rental housing voucher, which is one policy that can be uh, that actually supports rental housing in the country, but I think uh, it should be it should go beyond that. Uh, there should be it should be well thought of, and there should be uh, complementary uh, policies to be able to support that. And uh, again, review of the of the rent control is uh, is uh, needed at this time. Uh, although we are saying that the rent control now is is less restrictive as in the in the past. The, the recent literature is showing that even with uh, this uh, less restrictive rent control, uh, the control on prices is not uh, helping, helping uh, the development of the sector. Especially now, if you're going to have a, a rental voucher, actually the object, one of the object, intended objective of that is to increase investment of the private sector in rental housing which can be actually hindered by the presence of your rent control. Then there, there could be other ways of incentivizing uh, rental housing development by, by the private sector, especially if we uh, public rental housing seems to, we have tried that in the past, but uh, because of problems of, in terms of management, uh, this has not, uh, uh, this has really actually deteriorated uh, into your housing stock actually has deteriorated. Uh, next, please. Okay, the other uh, priority reforms has to do with the supply 
side of housing, and this is pursuing land-related uh, reforms. And the objective really of this is that you will avoid or hinder over-commercialization of your housing sector. So to government should ensure, provide controls that would uh, lead to speculative housing, uh, speculative increases of prices in housing, as well as what you say, as we call it, over-commercialization of the housing sector. And this can, can be done. One, I think of the legislative agenda that we have on uh, in, in Congress is the uh, implementation of a standard valuation for real estate properties. Yeah, the effective implementation of either land tax, which is already actually a law, but the implementation has to be uh, addressed. <laughs> and um, improvements in terms of ease of doing business, as well as titling, as well as building permits and licensing. The other uh, um, important reform would be uh, the provision of innovative housing finance for households that, but and but uh, government should ensure that this will not distort private market incentives. Uh, we should come up with tools that will mitigate the risk of market defaults that is related, often related to interest rate volatility. And the last one, which is actually in, still being studied, is to pursue construction reforms. And we have to look into more details into the construction industry, the supply side uh, value chain, from infrastructure development, the, 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 the provision of basic infrastructure, to construction, uh, to building operations, and to maintenance. So is there a way that we can have a more efficient system so that uh, we can, um, uh, more or less control or uh, have a more efficient system to enable uh, more affordable housing, whether this is for the, the low income group or for the middle or uh, income uh, market. So I think that ends our presentation. Thank you for your attention. And thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Balisteros and Ms. Ramos for your clear and comprehensive presentation. So uh, they have underscored the glaring reality that housing prices in the Philippines are prohib prohibitive for poor households and even for low income but not poor households. And um, these groups are experiencing housing stress. Our speakers also put forward several important recommendations to ad address the issue. And we can um, unpack those recommendations um, discuss uh, those uh, recommendations further uh, during the open uh, forum. So at this point, uh, let us listen to what our esteemed panel of discussants have to say about the findings and recommendations of uh, the study, as well as some critical aspects of uh, housing provision. Our first discussant is from the Department of Human uh, Settlements and Urban Development. We, we are very honored to have with us uh, IC Director Ruena Dineros of the Department's Public Housing and Human Settlements Service. Dr. Dineros also acts as the Deputy Head of the National Secretariat of the Task Force Bangon Marawi, an interagency body for the recovery, reconstruction, and rehabilitation of Marawi City. And um, under the Housing and Urban Development Coordinating Council, uh, which I believe is the predecessor of the uh, DHSUD, he served as the director for the Regional Operations Group and the Community Development Group. Uh, director Wen also worked at the National Economic and Development Authority as Senior e Economic Development Specialist under the Project Monitoring Staff. She, she has a Master of Science degree in economics of urbanization for, from the University College uh, London. We appreciate hearing from Director Wang not only her reactions to the study, but, all, but also her office's responses to a number of questions which she will cover in her talk. You now have the floor, uh, Director Wang. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, good afternoon to all who are present in today's webinar on housing affordability in the Philippines uh, by the Philippine Institute of Development Studies. 
I would like to thank the PIDS for inviting us in this webinar. The PIDS study that will be presented this afternoon or was presented already is of utmost importance to us in the housing sector since it focuses on one important component in addressing the housing backlog that is affordability. And of course, I would like to commend our esteemed colleague, uh, the BP of PIDS, Dr. Peng Balisteros, the research efforts made by her team in this study. And I must say that this study will count a lot through policy reforms in addressing the housing backlog in the next six years. Now, let me respond to the questions posed to Disud relative to the addressing the housing backlog. Next slide, please. Let me introduce to you first our agency, um, the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development. Um, is a newly created a department under Republic Act 11201. Uh, next slide, please. A law, a law is passed in February 14 of 2019. Thus, the suit is three years now since its creation. Uh, our mandates are, of course, uh, we serve as the primary national government entity responsible for the management of housing, human settlement, and urban development. And as a sole and main, main planning and policy making, regulatory program coordination and performance monitoring entity for all housing, human settlement, and urban development concerns, primarily focus on the access to and the affordability of basic human needs. Um, first, uh, of course, um, it is through the KSAs. Housing uh, that KS that housing backlog is addressed in the in the country. Next slide, please. Next slide. Every year through the government appropriations, the key shelter agencies like the National Housing Authority here, the Social Housing Finance Corporation, and National Home Mortgage were given a allocation for the respective housing programs, except of course for the Home Development Mutual Fund, which is a pension fund, uh, which is availed by a member who wants um, to avail of their housing need. Their major accomplishments from 2021 to June 2022 were as follows. For the National Housing Authority, there are a total of 80, 85,174 families uh, provided assistance and resettlement nationwide. Next slide, please. For the Social Housing Finance Corporation, there are 16,060 informal settler families assisted through its community driven and multi stakeholder shelter financing program. This is a total of 60 projects. Um, that were financed for the period 2021 to June 2022 with a total loan release of 3.2 billion. For NHMFC, next slide, please. The National Home Mortgage Finance Corporation serves as a secondary mortgage institution of the sector. Uh, they contributed 1,838 housing units under its housing loan receivable program. As an, as an SMI or secondary mortgage institution, NHMFC is committed to increase the liquidity in the housing sector, uh, their purchase of residential loans, mortgages, receivables, originated by both public and private institutions that are within the approved government standards. For Pag-ibig, for the same period, next slide, please. For the same period of 2021 to June 2022, Pag-ibig Fund financed 141,717 housing units. Of the 2021 housing loan takeout by loan package of 97.2 billion, it reveals that socialized housing 
program got 10% or 9.75 billion with 22,000 housing units. Medium cost is uh, 4.3 billion with 1,472 units. Open market is 3% or 3.2 billion and 787 translated to 787 housing units. Economics is 82% or 79% with 70,246 housing units or a total of 94,533 for 2021 housing units financed by the Pag-ibig Fund. The housing, um, the Human Settlements and Adjudicatory Commission uh, cases related to housing projects development they registered for 2019 cases disposed of uh, 2019 re regional cases disposed. Uh, we have 658 appealed cases disposed. And 95% of decisions of the commission is affirmed by the commission or by the court of appeals. What is the housing sector uh, budget for the past 12 years? And it's only 4% of the proposed 2023 of the sector. This only shows that housing um, receives a very minimal budget compared to the other sectors of the, of the government. With a total of 294,142 housing units, despite the, the challenge, um, or 85% of the 346,700 housing units targeted uh, for 2021, uh, the sector has accomplished 85% of these targeted housing units as planned for, time, for 2021 to June to 2022. On the question on how can local governments proactively do their part. Next slide, please. The Hadsi Denau the Disud is implementing the local shelter planning program where local government units are capacitated in the preparation of their local shelter plans. A local shelter plan is a roadmap to address the housing requirement for both the formal and informal sector of a city or municipality. It contains the local housing situation, or we do situational analysis, household affordability or affordability analysis, and resource analysis or local resources needed. And it also identifies main shelter strategies and the corresponding implementation plan to address the housing requirement of any given local government unit. LGUs or the local government units with the approved local shelter plans by their Sangganuan can provide funds or do land banking or partner with private sector for their housing projects or top programs of housing agencies appropriate for their constituents in, with consideration of on the affordability of each household. Let me give you a run through of our status of local shelter plan. As of November 2022, uh, of the 1,634 local government units nationwide, uh, we were able to uh, provide assistance in local shelter planning uh, to 1,571 LGUs or 96%. And right shop is like uh, 1,007 LGUs or 64%. Of the total 1,571 LGUs, um, which we have already provided uh, technical assistance, only 311 of that LGUs have an approved local shelter plan. This only means that um, local government units um, 
give um, small preferential to ha the housing need of their constituents because um, with the local shelter plans already prepared and there's a need for them to have this adapted for them to be able to have uh, funding for the construction of housing units for their constituents. Only 311 have uh, LGUs have an approved local shelter plan. Based on the consolidated housing data of our local shelter plan of the 1,571 LGUs, we were able to generate like um, as of September or as of November 2022, uh, the total housing need count is like 6.6 .6 million already, and of which um, 3.7 million are the informal settler families. And of this, uh, based on the local shelter plan prepared by them, there's a land need, a total of 60,700. 782 hectares uh, land needed for housing and identified so far uh, based on the figure or the data information provided, provided by the LGUs during the conduct of the training, there are a total of 102,769 hectares uh, identified for housing. Next question, please. Next slide. How can the private sector help and how is the government engaging it? The DISUD, one of um, one partnership we had right now is the partnership with the Habitat for Humanity Philippines. The DISUD is a member of a leadership coalition that was established for the implementation of Negros Occidental Impact 2025, which aims to build 10,000 housing units in sustainable communities that are clean, green, safe, disaster resilient, and with security of tenure. It is anchored on the public-private people partnerships focus on community cohesion and development, site design and development, housing finance and financial inclusion, and construction technology. Other members of the leadership coalition are the Hilti Foundation, Province of Negros Occidental, Ayala Land, Basay, Philippines Asa, to name a few. Another partnership we had right now with the private sector is, next slide please, is the partnership with the Subdivision and Housing Developers Association. The SHEDA partners with the DISUD for the implementation of the local shelter plan, uh, seeing that the LSP already contains um, projects for uh, implementation or uh, translating this into concrete housing projects, the SHEDA members um, deem it necessary or it's like uh, their partnership with local government units would be able to assist the, the country in addressing the housing backlog. So, through the local shelter plan where projects are identified by the local government units for their constituents, especially for the, for the low-income households or poor households, SHEDA have this MOA with the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development. As long as the local shelter plan uh, has been approved by the Sangganian, and that would be the time that they would be able to partner with local government units and translate these plans to actual housing projects. What are the government plans to address the housing backlog post-pandemic? Recently, the DISUD, with the new dispensation, uh, our secretary, the Secretary Akusar, presented to one of the cabinet meetings the introduce the pamba, pambansang pabahay para sa Pilipino or we call it housing for peace the same um uh, was presented of course during the cabinet meeting by the secretary so what are what is this pambansang pa, pabahay para sa Pilipino 
the problem is basically trying to address the 6 million units housing backlog, um, mainly due the, because uh, it's becoming like, you know, it's um, the magnitude is like increasing uh, because it's unaffordable um, housing and no access to housing finance. The solution is basically to have um, to produce 1 million housing units uh, yearly within the six year period. And of course, there's this um, uh, preferential interest rate of 1% to buyers. Next slide, please. And of course, there are three options. Uh, option one is like socialized housing which has a cap of 580,000. Option two, they call it upgraded housing. And option three is like the mid-rise and high-rise, which is like 1.1 million pesos. The funding solution is like, um, we'll be providing like 38,000 per year per household as an interest support. That's why, um, we're uh, forwarding or we're uh, requesting actually, we're spousing for a 36 billion uh, interest subsidy uh, to address this um, 1 million housing uh, production we intend to do to, uh, to address the housing backlog. And of course, the benefit of this four piece in housing is like uh, it would generate employment and of course, um, uh, taxes and other uh, like VAT and other transfer tax and of course uh, provision of employment or generate generation of employment like 1.7 million workers per year. What are the, the key features of this program? Um, we have to identify, of course, blighted areas where informal settler families are located shall be identified for mixed use development. And of course, developmental loans shall be provided by Pag-ibig PAM. Developers uh, shall do the development of these housing projects. And of course, local government units shall identify beneficiaries and will provide amortization subsidy support. The GFIs and other private banks shall do the takeout. And the SUD shall provide interest subsidy support from the national government or the General Appropriations Act. On a final note, we in the Sud would like to underscore that the housing sector bears the social function of the government. And with the public health issue of the corona pandemic, um, coronavirus pandemic for the past two years, the impact to the sector is significant in terms of addressing the housing backlog of 6.4 million housing units. The un un unquantifiable effect of provision of security of tenure, especially to the lower segments of the society is a function of better health conditions and of course, lower budgetary requirements for the health sector. Further, better housing facilities can be correlated to an improved peace and order situation and a more productive labor force and citizenry. In addition, Based on our co-discussant here, Mr. Paduhinog study, the housing sector industry is seen as an economic pump primer. In one of his studies conducted in behalf of SHEDA, housing activities generate substantial direct employment with an average of 8.3 laborers for three weeks or 124 Mondays and contributes a 3.4 multiplier effect on the economy economy due to 80, 80 plus allied in the industries attached to housing sector. As to the uh, study, um, the following are the comments of the Sud. Uh, the authors note that the 30% of income standard uh, overestimates housing affordability among the poor and underestimates among those in the upper income levels relative to the residual income method. In other words, the poor and low-income households are not able to afford price at 30% of their income. 
well, the middle income to which are able to afford housing price at more than 30% of their income. In the DeSoud's local shelter planning manual, we recommend, it recommends that the potential percentage, we're actually, we're doing this. It's part of our manual for the LSP. Um, it recommends that the potential percentage of household monthly income that can be used to pay for housing should not exceed 20%. It can be lower than 20%, 20% especially for the lower income uh, group. On the other hand, Pag-ibig fan allows maximum of 40% of take home of take home pay of a member borrower as a payment for housing loan amortization. This is based on income of an individual member, not on household income. The study also mentioned components of threshold for non-housing basic expenditure under table 14. Components like food expenditure, clothing, footwear, water supply, medicine, medical care, to name a few. Under the same local shelter, local shelter uh, plan manual, uh, we use a similar strategy in determining the potential coverage of income for household, such as food, fuel, light and water, transport and communication, clothes, education, and medical care, to name a few. On priority reforms, government-led socialized housing development, uh, the national, a national government agency, including the SUD, can only provide technical policy and financial support because provision of housing and its related law, basic services, have been devolved to local government units under RA 7160 and RA 7279. On the creation of a public housing fund for se from several sources, as mentioned earlier by the, uh, Dr. Peng, um, these are like balanced housing regulation, idle land taxes, uh, flotation of bonds, etc. These are already provided for in the RA 7279 or the Urban Development and Housing Act. On the creation of a multi-layered affordability housing program uh, for the unemployed, low income, middle income, it is proposed that a three-tiered socialized housing price ceiling be developed for the socialized income group. Increase on the role of local governments in social housing development rental and owner occupation. We support this in light of Valenzuela's LGU's Disciplina Village together with the National Housing Authority as best practice or model program on rental housing. On the national government, local government units can partner with NGOs, including international NGOs, private sector. This is being done, as I presented earlier, with Habitat for Humanity and SHEDA as um, and other NGOs and CSOs who are, were having partners uh, right now. On the priority reforms, the government is embarking right now through the key shelter agencies and in collaboration with the private sector in addressing the housing need of the underserved sector, the, the socialized housing sector, both rental and interest subsidies or direct subsidies are being advocated by the DISUD in the legislative branch. As mentioned earlier by the Dr. Pem, we're pushing for a rental subsidy uh, bill. Uh, and of course, on the Land Valuation Act, we support the passage of the Real Property Valuation Assessment Act or the House Bill 8453. Since this, since, since this will introduce vital reforms, to promote the development of a just, equitable, and efficient real property valuation system. Further, this will have greater impact in the housing sector that would redound to the benefits of the home buyers, especially of the socialized and low-cost housing program. As per one of the provisions of the bill, where it stipulates under Section 12, valuation of real property for real property intended for low-cost or socialized housing and other programs of the government, 
imbued with social policy objectives, the provisions of existing pertinent laws shall be applied. That's all and good afternoon to all. Thank you very much, uh, Director uh, Wang uh, Dineros of the HSUD for uh, your presentation. Uh, for, we appreciate your updates on um, the plans and initiatives at, of the HSUD. How is it working with the um, with the private sector as well as um, a, the indispensable role, indispensable role of the local government units to address the housing backlog? Okay, so from the government, let us go to the private sector, which plays an important um, role in housing provision. And we have with us Mr. Santiago Ducay, the Executive, Dir Executive Director of the Subdivision and Housing Developers Association, Association or SHEDA. Um, he is a licensed real estate broker and a licensed environmental planner. E.D. Sani has worked with government and private housing developers. He has a bachelor's degree in commerce, major in economics, and postgraduate degrees and diplomas from various institutions, including urban and regional planning from the UP School of Urban and Regional Planning, diploma in economics from the UP School of Economics, development pl uh, planning from the Center for Development Studies in India and Moscow State University, uh, and others. Okay, so we've asked uh, E.D. Sani to share his insights on a, on a number of topics in addition to his reactions to the issues and recommendations of the study. E.D. Sani, you may proceed. Thank you very much, Ms. Sheila, for that introduction. Good afternoon, everyone watching and participating in this important uh, forum on housing affordability. I would like to thank and congratulate PIDS for continuously doing relevant, timely studies, all to guide us to attain our development objectives. Also, I would like to thank the President of PIDS, Dr. Orbeta, the Vice President, Dr. Ballesteros, for giving SHEDA the opportunity to participate in this important forum. Let me start with my discussion on how the private sector can help in housing provision and how we can provide decent and affordable housing for all, especially the lower income groups. I'd like uh, to start and uh, note that foremost, the government has pegged the price ceiling for housing packages in our country. Socialized housing or those addressed for the lower income groups of the population is priced at 480,000, while that of economic housing for middle class is priced at 1.7 million per dwelling unit. Recently, this has been adjusted to 0.5. I would like to note that it is important for the government to periodically adjust this price ceiling also since inputs to production of housing has also increased. So it is important that this uh, take into consideration this increases so that we will be assured of uh, supply for housing, especially for the lower income groups. Second, I'd like to note that the private sector has continually, continuously worked and assisted in the government's provision of housing. Historically, we have been producing on the average of some 200,000 housing units annually, some of which 60 to 75% are socialized housing. Third, we at SHEDA, the private sector, work in synergy with the government in the provision of housing under the National Shelter Program. We provide feedback, we participate in the many activities and discussions, we monitor the project implementation, we provide information from the ground level to the policy and program pro proponents on housing. And we believe that this is important to have a meaningful program and efficient and effective program for housing. Fourth, we also pursue innovative programs that will involve the national and local government units, the private sector and communities themselves. And uh, we do this. And thank you, uh, Director Wang, for mentioning about the local shelter activities of SHEDA with the local government units. It is just for us to make sure that all these uh, 1,600 over cities and municipalities do have approved local shelter plans 
so that we can effectively implement our participation with this activity. Fifth, I'd like to make mention of rental housing and similar initiatives which can be explored and done, and we are doing this. Perhaps there can be a paradigm shift from owning a house of their own for every family or a roof, individual roofs for everyone to rental housing so that uh, immediately we can address the security of tenure and at the same time respond to the affordability of buyers. Sixth, vertical housing and affordable housing walk-ups utilizing new technologies and construction methodologies, sustainable, green and resilient approaches, which take into consideration very important mobility and access to work areas of residents are being done and being explored by the private sector. Seventh, it is very important that subsidies from the government, in particular, perhaps land. Our presenter, Dr. Ballesteros has mentioned about land uh, community trusts. And uh, we believe that this is important, wherein uh, houses uh, for the low income groups can be built. It is important for us also to simplify the permitting process because this has also a corresponding cost. The determination of uh, the right type of subsidies is very crucial because uh, over subsidy or if it is very easy for the beneficiaries to acquire housing, it will be also easy for them to let go of this facility. So it is important that we uh, determine uh, the right subsidy to enhance affordability and accessibility of the lower income groups. Perhaps the sweat equity from beneficiaries is also an important consideration. The community preparations, the counseling, the briefing and education on repayments will be very important so that a projects will be and can be replicated for other beneficiaries. And post-project management and property management are equally vital areas to consider. And this is being done and proposed by the private sector. On the areas of financing, which can be strengthened and introduced, again, number one, rental housing and rent-to-own schemes can be explored as affordability and income increases. Families can move from one flat to other units which suit their affordability. This will also allow flexibility for the government in planning and designing specific projects, and most especially in the use of land in the adoption of new strategies and programs in the future, vis-a-vis -vis the current practice of distribution of plots and individual titles. So the flexibility of utilization of land for the government will be there if uh, we will uh, design specific projects and new strategies. The third is with res respect to membership to Pagibig Fund or the Home Development Mutual Fund, the National Savings Scheme for Housing of prospective members, especially the informal se sectors or the informal settlers, so that uh, this will enhance their formal access to home financing. Fourth, there are many success stories of the country with respect to cooperative housing. Perhaps we can examine this. We can explore and replicate these success stories. Financial literacy and innovative collection schemes can be adapted to ensure higher repayments and replication of future projects. Fifth, the pooling of resources and actions of the government from funding sources, the IRA, additional taxes for revenues that can, which can be utilized for housing by the LGUs, the guarantee which can be provided by the Philippine Guarantee Corporation, the former Home Insurance Gar Guarantee Corporation to ensure participation of other private financial institutions and the private sector in housing initiatives are all important. Now, what are our projections for the post pandemic housing markets. The pandemic has made people realize the importance and the need for quality and better housing facilities. We were all in our houses most of the times during pandemic and uh, we have realized and sometimes we have to isolate ourselves and we have, we have realized 
that uh, it is better for us to have housing facilities. Thus, there is a renewed and greater interest from everyone for quality and housing that are responsive to the current challenges brought about by pandemic and the climate change. Despite these current challenges, which have been mentioned even by the previous presenter, Director Wang Dineros of the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development, we believe, or I believe, that the Philippine housing industry remains to have a bright prospect on account of the following reasons. First, the government policies and institutions are in place. The creation of the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development, as mentioned, uh, which is now celebrating its third year from its creation. And uh, we'd like to note that SHEDA has advocated for the creation of the DISUD. And this has ensured that specific department can now take cudgels for the housing sector. So it can take credits as well as blame and perhaps ensure a greater uh, budgetary allocation in the financial pie. Although earlier there was a blight uh, presentation also that uh, still the housing sector is given a uh, 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 very uh, little priority also in the allocation of the budget pie. But we will continue to work with the SUD, the private sector, to lobby for uh, the allocation of a better and uh, just budget for the housing sector. Second, the government financial institutions, the Home Development Mutual Fund or HDMF has announced the availability of some 100 billion pesos for 2022 for home end buyers and members of the fund. This is a good news for the private sector. And also, I'd like to note that other private financial institutions, particularly banks, have shown interest in the housing sector. And we must also make advantage of this interest. Third or fourth, the huge housing backlog. It was mentioned that it's 6.2. Five, and Director Wang has updated that this is now 6.7 million dwelling units uh, and it will continue to increase because of uh, number one, population growth, second, obsolescence and dilapidation, and uh, third, the houses that we lose due to calamities. You know, we, we are visited by at least 20 typhoons every year and we have to watch out not just on flooding, but also erosion and landslide. And fourth, the doubled up household, which has continued to increase also. And lastly, the unacceptable dwelling units or the blighted areas, which approximately occupy some 30% of major urban areas. Then fifth, the strong private sector participation is another bright uh, prospect in the housing industry. You know, SHEDA and other organizations from the private sector has been continuously participating and supporting the government's efforts to address the country's housing need. The presence of SHEDA and its strong regional, we have a strong regional membership as well, uh, I think would add and complement the efforts of the government. I'd like to note also the OFW sector uh, or the strong market for property developers. You know, the OFWs has continuously and annually uh, remitted some 200 billion to our country. So we, we should take note of this and most of this OFW would really want, they go outside the country to be able to have a house of their own. And also I'd like to note that there exist new technologies and innovations in housing construction, as well as the front and back end support to housing operations. There are technologies to make the operations more effective and efficient, thus enhancing also the supply and production of housing. On the initiatives of the government and the private sector to address housing backlog, well, as noted earlier, the Sud Secretary Akusar has recently announced the creation of 1 million houses every year for the next six years to address the housing backlog. And the private sector also is having and growing its plans and roadmap so, so as we can support this target of the government. We will continue to have dialogue and meetings with them to ensure that at least we should be able 
to attain uh, the majority of this target. Sheda has just been invited to consultation meeting in preparation of the housing and social development sector plans for 2022 to 2028 by uh, NEDA. And uh, this just shows how uh, we are really participating in all efforts, in all fronts of the government with respect to housing and urban development. The local government units are much involved in carrying out their respective housing initiatives also in coordination with the DISUD, uh, uh, the national government, and SHEDA is there also. We continuously to do uh, projects and programs. We hold memorandum, we, we, we sign memorandum of agreements with LGUs in the implementation of their respective local shelter plans. Then government from both the executive and legislative sector also are drawing out initiatives to fund the requirements of the housing sector. And we are there also to lobby to ensure that there is continuous and enough financing for housing. On uh, the business models, next, next on the business models, uh, which uh, the private and the public partnership for housing construction uh, can, can be uh, pursued, we, we, uh, we propose that uh, the important factors to consider are subsidies. Foremost, access to land, uh, this will be ideal if uh, the government will be utilizing the idle lands and the unused lands which the government owned. You know, 30% of the cost of the housing activity goes to land. And if this is done, the access or the uh, affordability will be greatly enhanced. Then uh, the sources of financing and templates for implementation and the identification of specific roles and responsibilities of the national government, of the local government, of the financial institutions, of the private sector, and even the communities themselves have to be drawn up. Of course, it is also important in, in uh, designing housing projects to consider mobility, the access to transportation networks, the basic facilities and services, you know, potable water and uh, electricity, the livelihood and economic opportunities, the skills and job trainings of the family heads, financial literacy and post project management and property management. All this should be done in coordination by the private sector and the local government units and the national government and the communities themselves. Of course, uh, lastly, as I have noted, the involvement of the community beneficiaries from the conceptualization of the program up to the implementation and management is very vital. For after all, we plan and we design projects for the communities and it is just proper that they be involved. On key issues and recommendations, of course, uh, the determination of real and most accurate housing affordability is very important in laying out the policies and programs to address the housing need and housing demand. And this is somehow shown in the residual methodology as discussed in the paper of Dr. Ballesteros, Ms. Rock and uh, Jenny. The cost of land and other major inputs to housing production. For instance, the cost, construction materials and labor, the permitting process are important considerations for the government and the private sector to watch to enhance affordability and intervention. A more active role of the government in the implementation of public housing programs to address the requirements of the informal sectors. The private uh, or public housing, well, our uh, colleague, uh, Director Dineros, is the head of the public housing office of the DISUD, and we are happy that uh, the DISUD is giving attention to public housing that would address the needs of those in the lower income groups and even those who do not have access to the formal financing. So again, very important, the determination of the right subsidy and specific sources of, of funding for sustainability of the programs are all vital. And we are happy that uh, the study also had made mention of uh, the land community trust, wherein there is a separation of uh, 
uh, the ownership of land from the building itself. I think this will also facilitate and enhance greater afford affordability. And this should be supported uh, even if uh, it needs some legislations as well. The private sector will support these initiatives. You, you see there's already a question there in the chat box asking if, how this will be implemented. Well, the, the good recommendations of the study will be picked up with the, by the private sector. And this will also be echoed in our many meetings and recommendations also to the government, both the executive and the legislative. On uh, While I agree that there is a need for some financial regulations and intervention, interventions from the government in the areas of implementation of idle tax, there was a discussion. There is a discussion on this in the study, financial regulations to address speculative activities. We would like to throw caution that uh, caution is in order as this might also result to further price distortion and eventually increase the cost of housing and adversely affect affordability. On property valuation process and methodologies, it is really uh, prevalent and it is true that we have so many methodologies on the valuation of properties and this has to be revisited and reviewed so that proper valuing of land uh, which affects also affordability can be done. There is also a need to re-examine and revisit uh, Republic Act 70 to 79 or the UDHA or the balance, specifically the balance uh, housing requirements provisions. Moreover, the current alternative compliance, you know, to the requirements, there are many al alternative compliance and then we believe this has to be reviewed to ensure that the real objective of the law that is the supply of affordable housing, specifically for the lower income groups, is achieved. Then uh, the provision of affordable and sustainable housing should be approached in an integrative manner as the sector cuts across all other important sectors. You know, the women, children, security, it has impact on health also, on employment. You know, 20, uh, we, we estimate, uh, for a housing unit, you would need at least 15 manpower requirements. And even if you quantify the man hours and the man days that uh, uh, housing will impact on employment, this can address as much as 5% of the total employment requirements. Then housing is very much important in productivity as well as there are more than 80 industries that are attached to housing. And uh, it was also mentioned that uh, the multiplier effect on housing is already some three point, maybe Dr. Padohino will also uh, delve on that. And these are all important uh, for the growth and development objectives of our country. In summary, uh, it is really important to look into uh, when, when, when uh, policy and program planners uh, for housing speak about uh, affordability, we view this uh, from two perspectives. First, on the cost, cost approach. Of course, those who build houses will look at, it is inevitable for them to examine and go back how much and compute the cost for production. However, it is also important to examine the affordability of the targeted clientele and beneficiaries. So it is up for us, uh, policymakers and planners from the government, from the private sector, from the academe, to strike a balance between affordability and cost, cost approach. So with that, uh, I'd like to end my presentation and thank you very much. And thank you very much, um, Executive Director Sani Dukai of SHEDA for your um, comprehensive remarks. Um, we'll hear more from E.D. Sani during the open forum. We still have one more discussion and he is, uh, well, um, Idi uh, Sunny already uh, mentioned him a while ago. Our last discussion is from the Academy, uh, Dr. Winston Padahino, who is the president of uh, the University of Asia and the Pacific. Um, Dr. Padahino is an expert on property economics, industrial economics, and strategic management. Um, he lectures in the senior executive and graduate programs of UANP on industry dynamics strategic management, corporate finance, leadership, and strategy execution. 
He also serves as a policy advisor to several industry associations, including the SHEDA, the Organization of uh, Social Housing Developers of the Philippines, the Semiconductor and Electronics Industries of the Philippines, and, and many others. Um, Dr. Padhinog obtained his Doctor of Business Administration degree from the De La Salle University's Graduate School of Business, and he also completed the International Faculty Program of the IESE Business School in Barcelona, Spain. So aside from um, his reactions to the study, we also asked Dr. Padujinov to give his viewpoints on the topics earlier covered by the other uh, discussants. Dr. Padujinov, you now have the floor, sir. Uh, good afternoon uh, to, to everyone. I would like to send my uh, uh, thank you to the president of KBS, uh, Babes Orbeta, for inviting me. And I want to say my regards to Dr. Marife Balisteros, the vice president, and of course, my friends in the housing sector, no? uh, Sani from Sheda, also uh, George C., I think, is here. The president, as well as executive director no, uh, of the Sud, no? and everyone here uh, listening to to this forum, allow me to share with you the, the slides that uh, I'll be using to give my uh, my uh, comments. So I think a, a number of very good ideas have already been pushed, and I'm glad that uh, I will be focusing on other aspects, more general aspects that uh, may be considered. But I just like to uh, focus my short discussion on two areas. First, uh, a reflection on the paper, because I just have to share with everyone, despite my administrative assignments in a university, I still continue to do uh, as much as possible housing studies taking into heart uh, a large portion of our uh, Filipinos who don't have any shelter at, at the moment. That is the one that is uh, motivating me to continue this research and advocacy to, as much as possible, provide them the right to decent housing. And finally, um, I will try to answer, uh, because many of the great ideas have already been placed forward by uh, Dr. Ballesteros and the team, also by Sunny and also by uh, Director uh, Dineros. No? And they are very, very, uh, very useful in uh, pursuing and at least attaining the 1 million a year housing target of the Secretary of the Sud, no? Secretary Akuzar. But let me share with you some of my brief reflections on uh, the paper. No? And it's a very good paper, as always. I am an avid reader of the policy papers of uh, PIDS, as well as specifically the papers published by Dr. Ballesteros, that continues to enlighten a lot of my own personal research on housing. So first and foremost, uh, uh, sometimes we tend to dwell on purely on the economic side of affordability forgetting that uh, it is just beyond economics that we are talking about because affordability talks about also enhancing the dignity of the human person. Sometimes um, we forget the fact that many studies do show that housing provide a lot of non-economic benefits as well if we provide them with decent housing like it has been shown that it reduces criminality, for example. Uh, another benefit of housing is that uh, it allows children to study and to finish their, their studies up to the college level and also reduce uh, exploitation, among other things. So one thing very interesting about the research is also to go beyond the benefits of economics, but also to see how it enhances our dignity as human persons, especially to those who cannot afford them. 
So when we talk about affordability, we talk about attainability, decency, and sustainability. And I like to encourage everyone to visit the website of BIDS to read the paper. Yes, there are many various approaches to measuring housing affordability because that is the demand side of the market. Uh, just to share with you that the, the uh, despite the huge demand for housing, many actually the studies have already shown using the conventional method, the residual uh, method, that a good number can actually afford. But you just have to also take into account market forces, why despite that, uh, the private sector is not willing to pump in and uh, fill in that demand. As Sunny said earlier, it is very important to have a close dialogue between uh, the government and the regulators, in particular of the price ceiling. At the same time, considering also the economic condition of the economy. Because I know that our present situation right now is not very ideal where inflation is very high and we are still reeling and trying to recover from the lockdown so my studies uh, in the past have been really been using the residual income approach but of course using the 30 percent uh, uh, criteria which the study may have said may actually uh, underestimate the capacity of those who can afford but under uh, overestimate also for those who cannot afford. But my discussion here is, my focus on my discussion are really those who cannot afford. Uh, and I think uh, that's also very important in our uh, discussion. It seems that they are being left behind. Um, and also I recalled how the data has moved from 2015 to 2018, when poverty incidents went down from 22% to 17%. There was a very large increase in affordability, actually, as the study has indicated. No? Only that with the lockdown, if you start putting in also the adjustment in uh, the recent prices, we need to see also the, especially for economic housing, you could also see the implications on affordability. No? That uh, those who can afford at the economic, sec uh, economic segment may actually go down to the socialized segment. No? hoping that there will be enough supply as well to cater to that particular demand. And uh, our current models at the moment, uh, if I can share with you my reflection, is that we're working heavily on the current uh, model of affordability where uh, only those with regular incomes, for example, and improving incomes can really participate in the formal housing sector. No? Uh, missing the fact that there's a very large sector and growing sector, uh, that especially the poor, that cannot be considered in this kind of model. That is why we have to rethink and to consider some of the innovative and very uh, novel ideas here, especially uh, of a public fund, for example, no? a public housing fund, no? uh, the land community trust. These are a very good ideas and to make sure that this will be ultimately redound to more affordable housing at the same time provide decent housing as well no? not just a roof uh, not just a small unit no? uh, the studies have shown that there are households with two and there's households with five no? uh, we cannot model a unit for example that is catering to five family members per household with something that is designed purely as a studio unit where only uh, a couple can actually stay. So it's very important also to think about along the lines of those who, who we, we, with unique demographic profile. We must remember that if you look at the history in the Philippines, what has rescued us from one crisis from another is our demographic dividend, our manpower. No? And we should support, we should find a way to support families, no? especially large families, no? uh, especially those poor and large families, also to have access to decent housing. No? Making sure that 
we will not fall into the trap of many countries that are now experiencing demographic winter. So um, much of the work recently that uh, I have personally done is really working on present the prevailing policy. So but what we have seen here in the discussion are, uh, uh, are new ideas to create another uh, operating environment for both uh, the buyers at the same time the developers to work. And that means that's where government should come in and create an enabling environment to allow for more innovative housing programs. So most of our work by far has been really incentivizing private developers to serve the low income households and tend to get a portion of that <laughs> for balanced housing. You know? and then rely on the non-government for other sectors, especially for informal settlers. But as what present, as presented earlier by uh, Director Dineros, there's really no uh, priority given to the suit right now with an allocation of even less than 1% of the total government resources. And uh, I think um, we, we, we really forget that uh, the poor uh, circumstances are quite unique. You know, they did not have, for example, the documentation that is needed to qualify and participate in formal housing programs, but they have the, uh, the jobs actually, they have the uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, activities that can to some extent support them. Now, let me go straight now to some of the questions, which I believe have been uh, thoroughly answered by the others and I will be maybe replicating some of them. So the three questions uh, addressed to me which are actually related when you answer it are the following. How can the government address the housing backlog? How can LGUs proactively do their part? What is the business model like the partnerships uh, for housing construction projects to help address the backlog? Uh, by the way, uh, the backlog is a result of accumulation of deficits. When I say deficits, it means that uh, demand continues to exceed supply. And an accumulation of that deficit creates a backlog. And this backlog has been presented earlier. Uh, no surprise, no, has been growing because supply in the very first place has not been catching up with demand. Uh, just to share with you some important facts. No? Our private sector, if you look at historical data, and if you can use both house and lots, and lots only as their capacity to develop, you're looking at no more than 320,000 maximum capacity no? of, of, of our uh, private sector developers no? to churn out units no? or even lots. However, our household size is increasing by at least 420,000 every year, assuming at 1.7% every year uh, growth. So that alone, uh, you can already see that we need also to boost capacity uh, for our private sector. No? And finally, uh, how can housing be made more affordable? So let me just, as I have said earlier, let me just focus on some areas where I believe it's very important. Now that the law, the uh, Mandanas Garcia law has been implemented and you and I already know the heavy debt uh, burden of our national government, we cannot really totally rely, for example, uh, for the national government to fully finance this. No? And with a significant portion of the resources moving to the LGUs, it is just but logical no? to also let and allow LGUs to, to participate in addressing these major issues. And for the private sector as well to be very much part of the whole program of addressing the backlog. No? So I think we really need a, a, a paradigm shift. We cannot continue with the same uh, scenario or the same operating environment we had, especially pre-pandemic, because with that current 
models that we have been adopting, I'm almost very convinced that we will not be able to uh, cover that deficit. No? But I think working on a clear number like 1 million housing units every year is something to start. And from there, work around a model no? to support that. So paradigm shift for housing for the answer that remains, that's my, my personal definition is those who cannot afford at all. And the underserved, remember there are those large number uh, of people who can actually afford, but the, the, the supply side is not willing to fill that because of other reasons that have already been raised earlier by Sunny. So public housing, I'm focusing more on those who cannot really afford at all. No? Uh, to make it really affordable, no, no market forces cannot really address this. No? We really need uh, very unique intervention. No? I think it has already been specified that we have to change uh, the, the model from ownership to rights or long-term lease or rental housing. And to also separate, separate the land from the housing construction activities, which can be undertaken by the private sector. So a community land trust, for example, will be a very good uh, uh, suggestion to, to pursue, suggestion by Dr. Ballesteros. And then since we are putting ceilings and uh, that those ceilings determine the, you know, many, uh, economic decisions of the private developers, we need to continue that that incentives are still there. And I think uh, we need a public housing fund really, you know, where uh, the much needed resources are, are there. You know? uh, uh, I have to restudy our A, what it, our A7279 that specifies that it allows already for uh, public housing funds. Maybe it's worth revisiting again, but we do need uh, resources here to make sure that we have the wherewithal to fund these public housing projects, specifically for those who cannot afford. And the voucher system should be targeted. Uh, it should only be given, as uh, Dr. Ballesteros already have said, to those who cannot really afford, whether this is for uh, rights or even for rental. You know? And uh, finally, uh, you know, the, if we want to really accelerate production, uh, working with many developers in their projects, have seen how tedious the process of approving a housing development uh, entail, you know? because uh, it, it takes at least a minimum of two years for land uh, to be useful for housing developments, no? to be finally converted to housing units available to the market. So that alone also contributes to, to costs. No? And at the same time, we have to remember when I say costs, it does not only pertain to the cost of the developer now, but to the costs that will be coming in into the future. No? As we speak, as we speak now, for example, uh, construction material costs are still increasing. So if there will be more delays, there will be additional burden to the developers, and of course, a lot of pressure once again for both uh, the buyer and the government to accommodate that. And finally, the role of the government unit. I think given the resources, including land available to the LGUs. I hope that uh, they will really follow through with their shelter plans as initiated by the Sud, that they will work together with their partnership. No? There are many good models that are already there, Bistecville, the one in Venezuela, the one also adopted by the FIDMA properties. There are already models that can be replicated and hopefully uh, it can be another tack that allows some LGUs to on their own address this because they are the ones who practically know that the, the beneficiaries. I was thinking that uh, in the event that a partnership comes about and it's the private sector that builds the housing units, the government owns the land, perhaps specific roles can be played like 
real property taxes may be exempted. Uh, they identify the beneficiaries, so the LGUs, because they are the ones who are really in the position, very close to the uh, to the people. They will be able to identify who deserves it. The social preparation activities, no, because we have to deal with them as the community before, during, no, and also during the occupancy of, of a housing unit. A very good model to adapt is the one that is usually used in community mortgage, mortgage programs. Once again, I encourage all of you to read that particular program um, in the PIDS website. And then I was thinking if the LGUs will be responsible for collecting the fees, the rent. At the same time, the private sector, besides doing the construction, uh, manages the property. Remember, um, as has been elaborated earlier, many of these uh, families, poor households, don't intend to stay there for a long time. They have their aspirations as well. They won't be staying there. They, they, they will move out ultimately to better housing. Now, it is key that when they vacate those housing units uh, because they have improved their plight, they're going into better, how uh, let's say more uh, expensive units, that someone should manage the property uh, to make sure that it becomes, again, ready to accommodate another beneficiary that will be identified, let's say for the LGU. And for the underserved, these are the ones who can afford, but there are not much supply coming. There are many reasons there, as I have said, perhaps we can accelerate the approval of housing permits, the permitting process. We have to continue to extend, once again, the incentive to private developers. And I'm really encouraging close collaboration, which is already happening no? between Sheda, the Sud, no? in particular, to really discuss these housing issues because the situation is very dynamic. No? They don't change. Uh, they don't. They are not permanent. They always change. No? And sometimes the law, or even policies, or executive orders, cannot cope with these changes unless there is close collaboration between the parties involved in addressing the housing backlog. No? And finally, once again, you know, the need for reducing the the housing unit cost, perhaps by having the, the land again uh, handled by the, the public sector and perhaps the private sector will be able to handle the construction activities as well. So these are some of the ideas I would like to share with you. And I hope uh, it has enlightened also and added to the discussion in this afternoon. Thank you once again and pleasant good afternoon to all. And thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Winston. Uh, Padrinog, um, for your uh, thought-provoking remarks, uh, we really uh, learned a lot from your uh, discussion. So at this point, friends, um, let's dive into some important points, which I think are worth look are worth looking take, taking uh, are worth taking a closer look. No, so at this point, may I uh, in, invite all our speakers and discussants to the. Uh, um, Q and A, Q and A part. So let's look at some important points from the discussion. And first is the role of the LGUs. Much has been said about the important role, the is indispensable role of our LGUs. But how receptive are they in 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 uh, in partnering with the government, in partnering with the private sector in terms of uh, public housing? No, Doctor Paduhinog and Doctor uh, Director Dineros have mentioned some. Um, good cases, no? He, uh, Dr. Padihinik, I, I think, mentioned about Mystic Bill and then the Director Dineros, uh, uh, no, but, uh, the case of Nobaliches. There are also good uh, cases uh, that we can find in the city of Manila. But in Director Dineros' um, uh, discussion, he's, she said that only 19% of our LGUs have local shelter plans no so how can we entice more lgus no to uh, <laughs> you know to to participate in in, in housing provision to to, to uh, participate in the provision of public housing um 
what incentives can we provide LGUs? Um, may I request uh, our speakers? Uh, perhaps we can we can uh, start from our presenters, uh, Dr. Uh, Ballesteros. You may want to uh, take the crack <laughs> in answering, uh, you know, to initiate the discussion on this question map. Oh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Sheila, for that. Yeah, I think uh, we have to put it in context, no? A housing, the housing is actually a localized uh, mm -hmm. issue and a problem. And it's really, even without RA, your local uh, government code, it's really within the, um, the jurisdiction of the local governments to address human housing problem. That's why we, we encourage citywide planning. So sila yung, uh, that's actually one of the, the important tasks that uh, they have and, uh, and will address the, the, the yung housing, housing issue. So um, if you know, diba, if we study housing, it's usually uh, um, Metro Manila or New York City, iba iba yun, iba iba, what local government has different ways of, uh, or programs of addressing your housing problem within within uh, the, the city. So I, uh, um, it's actually, I don't know if you need more incentive, but <laughs> but you see, it's like a, a national government. You have, it's, it's your task and the incentive probably is better economic development of your locality. Exactly. Because if you have uh, better city planning, you have more efficiency, you have, more, and this will, you have more business coming in and just translate into uh, revenues, increasing Correct. revenues, and uh, quality of life in that area. So very, to me, that it, itself is already the, the incentive. Ve very well said, uh, Dr. Ballesteros. I think our discussions have some something uh, uh, very important to say. I saw Dr. Um, E.D. Um, Sunny raise his hand. <clears throat> Sir, please go ahead. Then we can also ask um, Dr. Stan and uh, Director uh, Dineros. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sheila, for recognizing. Uh, foremost, I just want to, to note that uh, when Director Dineros mentioned about the few local government units uh, have uh, An approved. approved shelter plans, uh, the fact is there are a lot or, or majority of the local government units have shelter plans, although some mm -hmm. the prerequisite is really approval by the Sangunian. So okay. uh, it is where uh, uh, you know the 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 uh, problem lies, the approval of the Sangunian. But as mm -hmm. it is, there's really much awareness and technical and managerial capabilities of mm -hmm. the local government units and the interests to really uh, implement a uh, housing project, especially for the lower income groups. They are the ones mandated by RA 7279 to identify sites for housing and also mm -hmm. beneficiaries. And they are aware of this. Perhaps it is just for us to, to make sure that uh, the local, uh, I mean, the elected officials, uh, the Sangunian in particular, to approve their local shelter plans. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that, um, E.D. Uh, Sunny. Uh, Dr. Stan, would you have um, anything to say on this topic? Yes. Uh, in addition to Dr. Ballesteros and Sunny's uh, suggestion, we can also be very practical. No? We have to mm -hmm. inform our LGUs that uh, one, you know, these poor people, they mean these poor households are the ones voting mm -hmm. for you. <laughs> so. <laughs> If yes, you could provide them that, housing, yeah. they will mm -hmm. never forget you and his or their uh, descendants mm -hmm. <laughs> will not mm -hmm. forget you that you pro provided this housing for, for this family. You know, that, that's the first. And that's the most, uh, I think, powerful incentive for them to remember that they can leave a legacy behind. You know? mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. secondly, uh, the economic benefits of unleashing the value of land surrounding a, a, a good property. You can have retail space there, commercial space, no? mm -hmm. passenger terminals no? uh, coming up. No? And ultimately, we'll increase uh, business activities and license, license fees, business permits, no? real property tax. They have to be educated. I think many of our LGUs 
I think need to be educated about how important uh, housing, addressing the housing mm -hmm. uh, plan that they have. So maybe we just have to do a little bit more work, uh, Director Dineros, to tell yes, them so. don't forget <laughs> yeah. your voters. No? <laughs> if, if, they if, remember if, you. <laughs> if I may share, Sheila, sir. Go uh, ahead, sir. Um, Go ahead, ma'am. Some of the local chief executives um, only realize the importance of um, having an approved local shelter plan aside from the preparation after a calamity or disaster has happened. Mm -hmm. One experience we had is like, for example, in one of the, the local government units in the north, we knew very well that they have prepared a local shelter plan. And then this typhoon struck. You know what happened? They already identified under their local shelter plan that most of these families located in landslide prone area has to be resettled. You know, it's like, you know, they have timelines in the local shelter plan, the first three years, next three years, then the last three years. So they 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 uh, plan that this family should be relocated. But what happened? The local shelter plan end up in their bookshelves. Mm. It, it was not approved. In spite of knowing that these families, you know, would be affected by landslide anytime because we're visited by, you know, Typhoon 24 times. They did not do anything. They just prepared the local shelter plan. So later on, I'm, I'm sure, and we knew that realizing this, they already started to give significance on the local shelter plan, aside from the preparation, of course, it's approval to have this translated into housing projects and, of course, partner with, with the CSOs, of course, to the private sector. So I think uh, sometimes or most of the local government units, because they see the, the housing as a long gestation project, it entails a lot of cost on their part. Medyo nakakalimutan nila. So they, they rather do uh, construct basketball courts, you know, rather than housing. So, uh, when they when they experience these calamities or disaster, and it has affected their constituents, that's the time they do something about housing. Mm -hmm. Director Dineros, uh, may we know uh, which agency is monitoring the local uh, local housing or local shelter plans? Uh, I mean, is this under Kayo kami po, po um, kami po. Oh. Disud po. Yeah, po. yeah. It's mm -hmm. uh, since Hadzi and now it's under the the Disud law. So, and uh, now it's um, uh, before it's with the public housing office and with the department order, uh, it would be now uh, with the ELUP bureau of the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development doing that uh, the capacity building but in the implementation of the housing projects it would be that through it would be through the public housing and human settlement service group okay thank you very much uh, director uh, dineros okay let me segue to a question from one of our uh, participants miss um, executive director manuel aquino of the ctbrd um and May I address this to our researchers? Uh, perhaps uh, Tatum can uh, answer this. How do the off-site Galing Pook LGU-backed social housing projects such as Valenzuela and the CSO Gawad Galinga projects fare relative to the affordability standards or measures set forth in your study? Uh, Tatum? Uh, yes, Dr. Shar. Uh, I have not looked specifically into those projects, but um, for some of the government projects like the Community Mortgage Program, um, which caters to legally organized associations of low-income groups, and I assume those groups include the poor, um, which, as again, it, based on the study, do not have uh, enough income to afford housing. Um, I think there should be a uh, differentiated um, support to, to uh, particular groups. And even if we look at projections, for example, um, we see that uh, families in the second per capita income deciles um, uh, would need uh, a couple of years or more than a couple of years to reach sufficient annual family income for um, uh, 480k housing package, for example. 
So I guess um, uh, the point is to have differentiated support to particular um, income groups. And also one um, recommendation that was raised earlier is to uh, for the government to um, purchase a lot or to, to mm -hmm. own a lot while the um, families own the, the construction or the buildings. Thank you. you. Uh, yeah. Yes, please go yeah. ahead, Dr. Balisteros. Yes, I have looked at the Valenzuela project. Yes, and it mm -hmm. is very, and as mentioned also by uh, Director Dineros, it's a, a model uh, project. And I, I agree with that. They just charge 300 pesos. At the time mm -hmm. that I was looking at it, I, I don't think they increase it because the maintenance is also supported by the community themselves. So I think that's part of the, the um, uh, support or assistance that or non-monetary non um, provision that they, they provide, that they uh, put into the, the housing. So yes, that's one model that can be, that should be scaled up by in the different uh, um, LGUs. But as, you, as we see from the data, yung poor talaga, they cannot even afford probably 50 pesos per month. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there is that segment of the, the population that uh, you see this on the streets that really has to be provided with free housing. And they can probably pay for the rent in terms of labor. That's one uh, um, uh, pro a program to, to look into. Thank you very much, Peng. Okay, we have another question still on housing projects uh, from Rashley Dehwan, one of our uh, webinar participants. What is the average occupancy rate of the housing projects provided to those affected by calamities like in housing projects for Typhoon Yolanda survivors? Uh, perhaps uh, we can address this to, uh, to uh, Director Dineros of uh, Disood. Ma'am? Oh, I, I can't uh, give a specific rate, uh, but as far as I know, uh, during the, I, I think last year, during the turnover of the administration from, from Duterte to the new dispensation, I think, um, I believe there was uh, this um, issue on uh, the projects, the housing projects already done. And it was, you know, uh, turned over to local government units. But it remains unoccupied because, you know, it's like uh, it takes time for LGUs. Uh, again, you know, I, I don't know what happened, but they, already, they were already turned over by the National Housing Authority to them. And it wasn't turned over to the rightful occupant. So... Uh, I think there's this issue, and I, this was again, I think, uh, being asked. This will be asked, I think, in the plenary in one of our budget for for the for the housing. So, I, I do believe there are there are participants here from from NHA. I'm asking um, my staff on the <laughs> occupancy rate. Uh, it's um, according to the Interagency Task Force report of Yolanda in 2021. Yes. It, it is at 30%. 30%. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Thank you for that information, uh, Director Dineros. Okay. Let's jump to another important topic. Uh, you've covered um, uh, rental housing. Um, this, uh, Dr. Balesteros, Ms. Ramos mentioned this, and so was C.B. Dukai, and the other discussions. No? And we all know that the affordability of rental housing is really worth looking into. Uh, for instance, in the October 2022 inflation report by the PSA, one of the main sources of continued uptrend of the overall inflation was housing rental along with water, electricity, gas, and other fuels. So Dr. Balisteros mentioned about the rental housing, which guards against unjustified increases in the housing rent. Um, and he also mentioned about a proposed law to provide rental housing vouchers. But how feasible is this, you know, is the subsidy for the informal rental housing? market no uh we we know that there are rental houses catering to poor and low income households that are unregistered and are just based on uh verbal agreements 
uh, magbe-benefit ba sila dito sa voucher na ito? Or, or is this a way for, you know, the informal housing market market to 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 be formalized no to to be motivated na ma, masama sila sa formal market uh, dr balesteros let me first give a, uh, my response okay um actually if you look at the law at rental uh, housing voucher the intent also of that is to only support rental housing units that are not in informal settlements so it is in a way a, a scheme so uh, not to discourage because sometimes the proliferation so informal settlements are actually mostly mga renters eh, if you look at that so uh uh it the, that scheme is is one way for those who are renting in informal settlements to look for uh, the rental housing in the formal market. When you say formal market, you bear on le legal rights to yes. over uh, the owner of that. But of course, as we know, although we don't have yet a data on ano ba itong mga rental housing units because these are not registered usually, um, I, I am seeing that they're based on also on my personal experience na actually there are very few of these at magiging mahaba, it will be a long list of uh, uh, applicants probably for for rental voucher. Kasi yung supply is really very, very limited from uh, from my experience in, in the past. So um, I don't know how it will be implemented. Implementation-wise, it's very challenging. Mm -hmm. Although yung, yung uh, um, motivation of the law is and the uh, intent of the law is very good probably see dr stan would have more yes. <laughs> information on this <laughs> insights yeah dr stan yes please go ahead sir and then we can also ask uh director dineros <laughs> you know you we have to really distinguish between two rental markets na? those rental markets that are really uh, provided for by others purely on, on really on investment grounds. No? Uh, many of the studies have shown that there are many though there are many your, your studies have already revealed that you can afford uh, several times uh, housing units. No? So those housing units they rent that out, and I think it's the culprit behind high inflation rate no? because it's not uh, necessarily covered by uh, certain controls. No? They mm -hmm. can agree with other parties. No? Now, I think uh, if if we can have that uh, land community trust, in, I think an ecosystem we have to be put in place first to make sure that uh, we'll be able to really track uh, the, 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 the use of this voucher. No? Maybe the voucher will come in two or three steps after we have put up an ecosystem that will allow mm -hmm. us not to be abused. No? because it can be abused as well. What is important, for example, is, I'm just thinking out loud right now, is to really have that uh, initial ecosystem where you have the land community trust in place, no? and then it's very clear who are the targeted beneficiaries, no? or what is the price point there that will allow uh, government, for example, to more or less uh, make the project pay for itself, even the maintenance with that voucher. Uh, I think we have to put first a lot of things in place mm -hmm. before we even move because uh, rental voucher is, is is a very good idea. It just occurred to me based on this discussion. But mm -hmm. in the implementation phase, we need to set first in place the right, as they said, ecosystem Thanks. so that uh, it will not be put to waste no? and it mm -hmm. will be abused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Thank you, uh, direct, uh, Dr. Stan. Uh, Director Dineros, would you have anything to say regarding this topic? Actually, uh, the, the dispute is espousing rental subsidy. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, there are, I think, bills in both houses, Senate and Congress on this one. And our um, position in the, on this one, in fact, um, we have, uh, together with this, alongside with these bills, we have formulated 
um, rental subsidy um, program or policy in this wood already, but it's still um, for uh, approval. Um, a rental subsidy is like addressing the concerns of those um, displaced families affected by the build, build, build projects and also those affected by calamities and disaster. So it's like it's pegged on the uh, rent control law. It's like uh, that the cap, I think, is uh, 5,000 and we're only, we're um, recommending 3,500 um, uh, rental subsidy rate so that the one five would be like you know the counterpart of the the the, the household so uh i think the rental subsidy the voucher system um we subscribe to that because we all know that uh with the build build build, build projects especially the recent one the north south it's like there are hundred thousand families that would be displaced and this would be, you know, needing um, resettlement, with, we, which, all, which takes always, you know, two to three years. And it's like, you know, they have to go somewhere. They have, mm -hmm. they have to go somewhere. And, you know, it's like the government needing this for a major infra project development. And of course, for those affected by calamities and disaster, they can even, uh, in fact, we, uh, we expand you know, the the rental, it's like, you know, they can give this to the host, they can go to their relative or host family, the rental subsidy could go to that one. So uh, we have that already in the offing and for refinement and approval by by the executive of the, the department. So we subscribe to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Director Dineros. We have um, um, a couple of questions here about the CMP, the Community Mortgage Program. Uh, but uh, however, um, we have PIDS has conducted studies. We have you know, some publications about uh, the CMP in our, on, our, uh, uh, on our website. So maybe direct uh, uh, the one who um, asked this question to our website for um, uh, studies about uh, the CNP conducted by PIDS. Okay, let's uh, go to another question this time uh, from Christopher Rollio. What are the potentials for land value capture mechanism in tapping finance for housing? This is in the context of the Philippines as rapidly urbanizing and more lands are expected to be opened to be opened up to developments to meet urbanization needs. Um, Anyone from our uh, panel of uh, speakers? Anyone? Sheila? Yes, please uh, go ahead, sir. If our colleague, uh, Mr. Chris Rollio, is referring to the land and the values of this land, uh, which are occupied uh, mostly by uh, informal settlers or blighted communities, and normally these lands are of high uh, value already and located in prime, uh, these are prime lots and prime location. And uh, really possibly the right valuation and the right program, perhaps re-blocking or being able to attain a specific portion of the land and be freed for other, uh, uh, for other purposes, perhaps this can contribute further uh, the value of that specific land freed uh, can contribute also to the other initiatives on housing. So yes, it, it can be done. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, ED, Sonny. Okay. Well, a while ago, we have been talking about legislation. And uh, this question is uh, can be maybe answered by any of our speakers. Uh, do you see any gap that must be addressed in terms of legislation that must be addressed to make resolving issues in the housing uh, sector easier? Well, we have uh, you have mentioned some some um, proposed uh, laws, no? But uh, I mean, up until now, uh, the National Land Use Act has not been passed. No? And that is a very important piece of legislation. <laughs> Would you have any comment on this? No? Uh, I, I saw Dr. Stan uh, smiling, sir. 
Well, uh, it is really indeed a challenge. You know, you're talking about a national land use plan. No? In fact, the LGUs have a club to fulfill <laughs> the comprehensive land use plan. And many of them have yet to, to comply <laughs> with that alone. No? Putting that even at the national level can be very challenging no? uh, uh, for us. I think uh, uh, sometimes we cannot really wait uh, mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for this legislation to pass, but mm -hmm. try to work already on the legislations that are already available. You know, if yes. you read if you read the local government code and the power that an, an LGU uh, has, they they have a lot of flexibility actually mm -hmm. in uh, in uh, starting their own, specifically the land use plan. They have mm -hmm. a large influence on that actually, you know? and even fundraising, you know? uh, even joint ventures. Uh, you you may have read yeah. the joint venture between. Uh, like Iloilo, city government, and Schumart to transform the public market, for example, transform it into a, into a, like a mall. No? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you, you, they have so much flexibility. They can even go into PPP, yes. different types of PPP mm -hmm. models. So I think uh, while we are waiting for those legislation to pass, let's mm -hmm. make use of what is already there That's right. and with a lot of largas. No? Mm -hmm. of some LGUs, I think mm -hmm. that they should put into good use those resources that they have. No? That's over mm -hmm. 250 billion, uh, uh, I think, money being poured into the LGUs uh, this coming year. No? Yes, uh, given the, <laughs> the mandanas, yeah, yeah. And you're right, sir. Uh, we don't need, uh, we don't need uh, for the, for the um, National Land Use Act to be passed, we can you know, capitalize on existing mechanisms, no? Uh, we have the um, um, comprehensive land use plan. And that is something that has to be, uh, you know, um, strengthened, that has to be followed by our LGUs. Uh, we had a study before uh, done by one of our uh, research fellows, which indicated that not all our LGUs are have updated comprehensive land use plans, no? That itself is an indication that there that is a gap that must be addressed. No? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Padahinog. So we still have some more questions. So with your indulgence, uh let me let us cover them. No. Uh we have a question from Ryan Pan. Okay. Considering the recommendation to shift the subsidy. From the private sector to the public sector, how does the research find the role of balanced development housing regulation under the recommendation? Is the study implicitly suggesting the repeal of socialized housing compliance requirement of private developers, considering that removing ta tax exemptions or other forms of subsidy support on the supply side effectively renders uh, socialized housing compliance confiscatory if not result in undue taxation. Um, okay, I think this is directed to our um, study authors. Either mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Balisteros or Ms. Ramos can answer this or both of them can, uh, um, you know, can answer this question. I think when Once, we... Oh, yeah. yeah. Please... Uh, I think that you, um, we should not misinterpret the recommendation. When we say uh, government subsidy, we are, are government-led socialized housing. We are just saying that uh, this, the projects or programs are usually non-market solutions. Mm -hmm. So the private sector can be a partner to it, but, what I'm, but uh, the subsidies are, are really... Uh, uh, more directed, and uh, uh, the the government takes the lead on what would be a the appropriate program or project for specific uh, um, sectors. And I think it's very important to note uh, what was mentioned by uh, by also Dr. Padahino, Dr. Stan, that it is not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. So it's not mm -hmm. as if you supply and then we will fit the family. Sometimes it's actually, in most cases, especially for for uh, for those in the low income sector, it's it's demand driven. 
So uh, it's not um, putting them just in the box that, that we plan, uh, which is usually if it's a supply-led uh, um, uh, led project. And uh, when we talk about uh, the public sector fund, we're looking at the balance housing as potential sources of new funds. So it's not funds. from the government, but uh, new funds. And unlike in the past that that uh, um, the developers can uh, provide compliance in terms of uh, um, establishing our, or in terms of socialized housing projects, what we suggest is that it should be held as a scroll, a scroll meaning there is mm -hmm. government will will be uh, will use these funds for for planned projects already. So he not necessarily um, the developer who's going to make plans on how on on how to use that that fund. So it's just putting in this public fund, and it can be used in different ways, not just one 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 uh, one size or one approach mm -hmm. I, I, that, that's actually the, the the essence of the recommendation on on, on government-led socialized housing development thank you very much for that clarification uh dr balesteros okay now we are down to our final question and um let let us um uh, talk about i i mean briefly no because we don't have uh uh, much time left. No, let's talk about resilient housing. No, climate resilient housing. We know that the Philippines is exposed to a lot of natural hazards. At sa mga pagkakatong ito, ang apektado talaga yung yung mga mahihirap. No, so what programs are in place? No, um, on the side of the gov of the public and the private sector too, in in terms of ensuring or promoting climate resilient housing no? um may we hear first from uh the sheda um thank you miss sheila well foremost uh the housing standards is being prescribed by the government you know we have batas pambansa 220 for socialized housing we also have pd957 for economic housing so the standards are there However, uh, we very timely and uh, uh, very relevant is the make mention of resilient housing and market dictates already that uh, people clamor and uh, this is important already and some developers are doing this. I also would like to make mention that uh, the Board of Investments uh, under the Department of Trade and Industry, the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development and SHEDA is into discussions already of what are the characteristics and definition of smart housing and smart cities. So we are identifying uh, what are these different uh, characteristics. So do they make use of uh, innovative and ready local materials in the construction? Do they make use of technologies uh, that are available? Are these uh, designs sustainable enough to withstand uh, the challenges of uh, climate change? the wind, uh, wind velocity of the different typhoons that come, uh, what is resilient uh, housing designs? Are these green uh, housing, which uh, implements uh, to some extent uh, water harvesting uh, and also the use of solar energy, uh, the, the design or the orientation of the house that captures uh, the direction of the wind so that everything would be uh, also uh, facilitated with respect to energy efficient all these things are being discussed of what what is green and smart uh, mm -hmm. uh housing and communities that takes into consideration again all the basic needs especially on uh the the, the mobility and transportation and uh, the employment uh, opportunities and of course it should consider the culture and tradition of uh the home uh, home buyers and the residents. Thank you very much, uh, Edi Dukal. Director Dineros, would you have anything to say? Um... Yeah. Actually, last year, the NDMC uh, full, we have this uh, NDMC full council resolution. Actually, uh, it enjoined uh, the Department of Human Settlements Development. Um, 
to prepare resilient housing framework um, and the transfer of the emergency shelter assistance program from from DSWD to the Sud. So, in light of this uh, resolution, the the DSUD, um with the assistance from the technical assistance from the World Bank, uh, we were able to prepare a resilient housing framework. Basically, the the framework is anchored on um, building better before. Um, you know, it's like um, we 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 present to them through the the framework prepared the different strategies on building houses, temporary shelters, uh, be before the occurrence of disaster to minimize uh, integration of social preparation and like um, transparency in the entire housing assistance program, empower the community, leverage and build on the skills, consider the expansive expandability of units, and of course, contextualize the prevailing hazards and vulnerabilities of the community. This has been already turned over. We have already the turnover of this framework to the DSUD and right, right now to operationalize this framework, we will be engaging the, the public through IEC and of course the local government units. And of course, ensure the prioritization of the most vulnerable shelter beneficiaries through a systematized data information management. So we will be rolling out this uh, resilient housing framework, which you mentioned. So um, of course, taking uh, off from this, the local government units, I'm sure they would pick up something on this one for them to be able to address, you know, or at least mitigate uh, before any calamity disaster or build better before any calamity or disaster. The, the housing um, you know, of their constituents. So, thank you. Thank you, Director Dineros. I think Tatum has uh, an input to this question. Tatum, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Short. Um, so, uh, actually, we were able to talk to some NGOs and also foundations, and they were able to give us some estimate on um, resilient housing. And some of them even said that... Um, this resilient housing is not necessarily expensive. So, for example, the Base Bahay Foundation Incorporated has uh, mentioned that for their cement bamboo frame house, um, it would cost around uh, 225000 for for the building itself or the building construction for a 25 square meter size. So they said that the bamboo technology is actually um, environmental friendly. And also there are other organizations like the Build Change, which um, uh, estimated house improvement, uh, resilient house improvement. And they said that um, for a 50 square meter house, um, that would cost around 479,000. Of course, um, these estimates would not include um, the cost of the land and site development, but these are um, things that we need to consider so that in the long term, we would probably um, end up um, spending less on 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 housing. Thank you, uh, Tatu. So at this point, uh, to cap our discussion, may I ask our uh, all our speakers for some brief parting words if they have any. So may we hear first from our study authors and presenters. Uh, first, let me let us hear from Dr. Balisteros, followed by Ms. Ramos, and then our discussants. Uh, Peng. Dr. Balisteros, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Sheila. First, I, I want to thank uh, my, my colleagues from the housing industry for your participation and for your insights on the study as well as on the housing sector. And I think we have a lot of areas of convergence in terms of the recommendations. And uh, uh, so what I think I want to, to leave is that when we talk of how affordable housing and and um, and the unserved sector, I, there's a, there's going to be a lot of subsidy. The the subsidy is huge, but uh, and the fiscal bur burden is is real. But I think it's important to note that this is not permanent. As the country matures and and providing prov uh, you uh, the 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 policy can shift towards a more a liberalized and more market uh, oriented policy. 
uh, and it, but it is important to address the housing needs already of this sector in terms of resiliency and uh, to address their vulnerability because that is also that has also implications in um, their ability to move out of uh, poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pen Ballesteros. And may we hear from um, her co-author, uh, Tatum. Tatum, please. Yes. Uh, thank you also to the speakers and also those who attended um, this webinar. Um, I just want to emphasize that um, given the extent and intensity of housing stress in the Philippines, we will have to revisit ideas that have been accepted as common knowledge, such as those involving um, the deb uh, deb debates on home ownership uh, versus rental, horizontal versus vertical housing development, among others. Um, I think suitability of housing depends on the capacity of the families to afford their respective housing types. And um, it would be inappropriate for families to invest in particular housing types when they are not capable to, su to sustain respective payments because this can push them further into unmanageable debt or even poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Tatum Ramos. Okay, now let us go to uh, our fi the final remarks of our discussions. First, uh, Director uh, Rowena or Wen Dineros from the uh, this soon. But ma'am, uh, we have uh, two uh, last uh, last two questions for you. I was reminded by our webinar team. One is from engineer Madeleine Hilda Abelera. How can yes. teacher folk avail of the um, informal settler families loan if they live hand to mouth and aren't members of Pag-ibig or SSS? And second, is it necessary to seek the suit's approval of a local shelter plan before it can be approved by the LGU Council? Yeah. First, I would like to respond to the uh, Fisher Folk, uh, you know, uh, requirement for financing. Actually, uh, that is one of the subjects um, being left <laughs> behind on this uh, concern. Uh, in early, in mid 2020s, we have this study on an ADB on the development of poor urban community sector project. And under that project, we have this uh, technology on housing microfinance, uh, which we espouse. And under that, we were able to develop the housing microfinance product manual. What we're saying is uh, for, for pro poor financing, I think. Um, Microfinance technology is very important, very crucial. You know, um, microfinance technology is like, you know, they season their clients. We have this both banking and non-banking microfinance institutions. Basically, ito yung mga vendors, yung mga tricycle drivers. You know, they, they, they borrow first for, for like, you know, for livelihood. And the microfinance, you know, they season them. And after seasoning them, let's say after several takeouts, they could they could borrow for home improvement or even you know uh, for 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 housing. So that's the housing microfinance uh, product that we were able to develop um, under the ADB project then, and which um, right now we have this um, again uh, develop uh, the roadmap for the housing microfinance. What we're saying is like, you know, this Fisher folks, the informal sector, they can really avail of a housing loan through the microfinance institution because under that product manual, um, this institution would accept collateral substitutes. You know, like, yeah. you know, if you have the CELA, the Certificate of Entitlement and LAT Award, or even through the you know, showing this institution that you were able to repay the amount you, you borrowed for your livelihood first. So after a seasoned client, you can be able to uh, borrow funds for your housing improvement or housing requirements. So yun yung sinasabi namin na we're trying to develop. A, actually, we have a roadmap on the, this one. The, the problem with the microfinance institutions, you know, they're serving, you know, poor, like, you know, they have to have longer repayment period, but the source of funds 
of the microfinance institution is is coming from a short you know a short uh repayment for them so it's like we're 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 trying to find ways that that there could be financing for the microfinance okay. institutions so that they would be able to address this um uh, requirement of the the informal sector for housing oh. okay, on the other one on the local shelter plan actually um we have this hands holding with them we as much as possible um before they submit it to the Sangunian for approval, uh, the, the DISUD um, assist them in finalizing the document. We ensure that the local shelter plan, you know, when we when they present it to the to the Sangunian for approval, walang hitches, as in they would be able to respond to the queries of the the committee chair, etc. That's why even we even invited during the presentation to the to the Sangunian of the local government unit so that they would be able to, you know, address some concerns, issues that would be raised by the committee. So uh, it's like, yung ano lang, approval or we see to it na yung, yung content, etc. and everything, the figure, the data is solid before they present it to the Sangunian. Okay, that's thank good you. to know. Director Dineros. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Director Dineros. And now let's go to um, E.D. Um, Sunny Dukai of the Sheda. Well, uh, again, thank you to PIDS for these very interesting discussions. Uh, can we have a part two, a roundtable discussion perhaps? <laughs> Uh, but uh, foremost, I'd, I'd like to say that the provision of housing impacts on all of us. And housing is not, is, is not just a right, but uh, should be coupled with a responsibility as well. And uh, it is not only the role of the government to address the housing need, but all of us, uh, the academe, the national government, the local government units, the basic sectors, the NGOs, the private sectors have all, and the communities themselves have all roles uh, to play. And we have to work together to continue having synergy, putting our minds together, our efforts, our knowledge, our strategies. And perhaps very soon, uh, we will not just make a dent on uh, the housing need, but maybe in the near future, we will be able to address the entire housing need. Thank you. Thank you very much, E.D. Sunny. And now let's hear from Dr. Stan Padulhinog of UANP, sir. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you so much to PIDS no, for organizing this forum and inviting uh, me and, and the other very good panelists here. I have to admit that uh, I continue to, er to learn a lot no? uh, fr from this forum to widen uh, the knowledge on in this very important issue. And what is this um, issue we're talking about? We're not just talking about here a, a, a house. No, We're really referring to a home. It's very important that uh, we are investing on our human capital. Um, we cannot ignore a large section of our society which will be a future contributor to our economy and to, to nation building in particular. So sometimes we do tend to be bogged down by the finances that are involved, but I think we have to think long-term because we're not looking here at uh, just ordinary labor force. These are our human mm -hmm. capital. No? We need to invest mm -hmm. on them and we, if we invest on them well, we will, we will reap the rewards, not like any other capital in which we invest on. Thank you so much for organizing this activity. And I would really love to uh, see more similar studies that has been undertaken here by Dr. Ballesteros and team. And thank you very much to Dr. Stan Padahinog. So friends, please join me in thanking all our speakers for the nuggets of wisdom that they have shared with us this afternoon. And thank you too to those who joined in the discussion by sending your comments and questions. So let's show our appreciation through a big virtual clap. And uh, here are the winners of our webinar raffle. Okay, so... Um, from Zoom, we have Jed Carlos Cipriano and Mildred Maglaya. And from Facebook, Ellie Kureg Estrada. So to, our, to the winners of our webinar raffle for um, uh, this week, we will um, our webinar team will get in touch with you for the delivery of your prize. And finally, we have some reminders. 
So you can access all the presentations from today's webinar on the PIDS um, website. And the flash on the screen is also the link to the full study of Dr. Ballesteros, Ms. Tatum Ramos, and, and, uh, and uh, Ms. Jenica Ancheta. Okay, so also please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. Your comments are important to us to improve our virtual events. Please regularly visit our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We also have a YouTube channel where you can access the recordings of all our events. And we have another webinar uh, this November. So next week on the 16th, we will have our webinar on uh, the analysis of the 2023 president's budget. Uh, former research fellow Justine Diocno-Sicat will present her assessment of the 2023 National Expenditure Program, more commonly known or more popularly known as the President's Budget. And finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academe, civil society, business, and international development community uh, who joined us today. Maraming salamat po. So this concludes our virtual policy forum for today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and see you next week.